Okay, welcome to the Inspire Show. This is August, and I'm really excited to be um, interviewing and speaking with today Bruce Cryer, who's um, a, a specialist in human uh, development, ingenuity, creativity, and health and wellness, and has a, a really illustrious career that uh, we're going to dive into in just a moment. But I just for those of you who don't know uh, the Inspire Show, it's part of the... Um, the uh, Awakening Village, and uh, the Awakening Village has a number of different aspects. We have live um, gatherings here in Montreal, something like the Creative Camp, which we do on Fridays, and new things coming out on uh, Wednesdays where we will be meeting called Career Alchemy. So a little bit more about that later, but this is the Inspire Show where we interview change leaders from around the world, local and, and abroad, to hear a little bit about their story, how they got started, what the, wor the work that they're doing, and, um, and to learn a little bit about some of the things they've had to overcome and how their work is really helping in the world and, and to learn some tips and tools from them. And we also have as part of the, the free membership of the Awakening Village is a whole kind of library of videos and, and texts and, and articles and so forth. And then finally, we really have a community of like-minded people who are trying to really live their soul's gift to express their greatest, um, their greatest um, gifts to the world and, and do that in support of one another, whether it's providing services, whether it's just helping. That uh, network is, is a growing network, and there's, again, more of that to come. So I'd like to introduce Bruce. Bruce, um, thank you so much for coming. You're coming in from California. I know you live now in New York, but you're back, and, and he's going to tell us a little bit about what he's doing in, uh, in California with Stanford. But if I could just introduce him, uh, there's a lot of wonderful things that you've done in your life, and, and I don't know how we're going to get to it all in one hour, but uh, we're going to try because there's some real juicy things we want to get uh, down into. So first of all, he is the founder of Renaissance Human, which is a, uh, an organization he'll tell us a little bit about. He's also an adjunct fa faculty member at Stanford University and a senior advisor and former CEO of HeartMath. So hopefully he'll talk to us a little bit about HeartMath. Some of you online know about HeartMath. And he spent the last 30 years researching and teaching innovative approaches to maximizing health and human performance. So Bruce was the key architect of programs that incorporate HeartMath's innovative biomedical uh, research into practical tools and strategies to enhance health, performance, uh, creativity, innovation, and productivity for both individual and organization. He's also was named one of the top 50 thought leaders in personal excellence and is a sought after mentor and performance coach. His business background is a blend of sales, marketing, and business development combined with executive management and strategy. He's been published in the Harvard Business Review and is a keynote in four continents. And has, um, he is also a co-author of uh, Chaos to Coherence, which, is, uh, which offers the power of change performance and a number of strategic articles, scientific articles, sorry, on stress and performance. His clients are varied, and they include companies as well known as Cisco, the Mayo, uh, the Mayo Clinic, Dropbox, NASA, Shell, Unilever, Johnson & Johnson, Stanford Business School, and um, dozens of high-performing organizations worldwide. After surviving cancer, staph infections, and double hip replacement, he created what makes your heart sing? Again, I want to talk a little bit about that with him today. And that he did that with the Emmy Award winning composer Gary Malkin to awaken the creative power of inspiration in individuals and organizations. And today, his new enterprise, Renaissance Human, is a creative vehicle for visioning leaders to reach their full potential. His album of original songs entitled Renaissance Human is being released this year or already been released. So welcome. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Whew, that's a lot to cover in one hour, huh? I get tired. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So let's start out with just talking a little bit about what a lot of people might know you most for is HeartMath. Can you just explain a little bit about HeartMath, how you got involved with it? And, um, and then we'll talk a little bit. I have a couple more questions on that. So what is HeartMath? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very privileged to have been part of the original team of HeartMath and, and still have a role. Uh, last week I taught a course at Stanford on HeartMath. 
Uh, HeartMath began as a nonprofit research organization to understand what we came to call heart intelligence. And the view was that the heart was far more intelligent that, than recent science was believing. Um, science had kind of dumbed the heart down to being a pump and nothing much more. And we believe that was not only wrong, but dangerously wrong, <laughs> that there was so much more involved with the heart, wisdom and intuition, courage, things that for, for millennia, uh, civilizations have been founded upon, religions have been founded upon, but somehow we, we lost our way. And so HeartMath felt that because science is God in many ways in our culture today, that we needed to use mainstream science if we were ever going to show that there was more to the heart than simply being a pump and being the, the source of, uh, of, uh, of inspiration for poets and romantics and mystics. So we set out to, to do that pretty basic and, and fundamental research in the early 90s, began to develop techniques based around the, the learnings and learned that indeed there's a tremendous amount of intelligence in the heart, that the heart is absolutely linked to emotional state. It's absolutely linked to cognitive performance. It's absolutely linked to our fulfillment in life. And so HeartMath became an organization serving many masters in the sense of, of uh, tailoring its, its work in, into the world of, of high corp large corporations, into the world of the military, into the world of educational systems, into the world of average people, uh, kids who are needing help to study for exams, you, know, you name it, let alone healthcare, with the, the multiple reasons why people's stress be can become debilitating. So it's, it's been a marvelous uh, experience to have been part of the core team since the beginning and even to be a CEO of it for about 11 years. Uh, and, and it will always be a huge part of my life because uh, I wouldn't still be alive were it not for uh, And I still am inspired by the value of it pretty much every day. Wow. So can you uh, explain a little bit about how it works, the heart math? I, I understand about co coherence, coherence between the brain and the heart. How does that work and, and how did it help you with your health? Yeah, well, part of the idea is that, you know, when you hear terms like getting in the zone, what does that mean? Or, or people, athletes or psychologists talk about flow and flow state. Um, you know, all those kind of metaphors, if you will, a lot of, I think a lot of people have intuitively felt like there must be some science to that. It's not just random. You, you kind of accidentally fall into the zone and you fall out. Couldn't there be some way to repeat that? Or when, you, when you're in a flow state, there's got to be a way to get there. Maybe not every single time. Maybe we can't you know, completely prescribe it, but there must be something we can learn about the physiology beneath it. So that's what we started to learn. And one of the things we found out was that when any human being is feeling a positive emotion and it could be joy it could be compassion it could be humor it could be love it could be peacefulness that at those at those moments whether the energy is high like passion would be or lower like peacefulness would be in either case the, the, the patterns through which the heart beats looks like a sine wave is this beautiful smooth pattern contrasted by when we're feeling any kind of stressful emotion and that could be anger overwhelm depression, apathy. So no matter what the dynamics of, of the neg quote, negative emotion might be, the pattern of the heart is chaotic. It's not in sync. It's not smooth. And we studied hundreds and hundreds and eventually thousands of people in the early 90s and, and found that it was pretty, pretty black or white. If you were in a, quote, stressful emotion, the heart pattern looked chaotic. If you were in a, quote, loving or positive emotion, the heart pattern looked smooth. Now, in a, in a day, you know, we go through all these variations. It's not just one or the other. There's all these variations of gray kind of in between. But what we learned was that that pattern not only affects immune function, hormonal function, biochemistry. It affects the ability of our brain to process information well or not. Smooth rhythm equals cortical facilitation. Our cortex is, is literally enhanced when the rhythmic pattern of the heart is in that smooth form, which is why most of us have some strategy like taking a walk in the woods when we need to clear our head or, or staring at an amazing sunset because, ah, oh, the magnificence of that sunset puts us in a different state. We know that. And in that different state, creative ideas emerge. We remember things we've forgotten. We say things the way we want to say them, not like we say them when we're, when we're acting stupid or frustrated or overly angry. 
So heart math kind of put all this stuff together and said, yep, emotions connected to the heart. Yep, the heart's connected to the brain. It's all a feedback loop. And we can interact with the whole thing. And the more you breathe in certain ways that, that enhance the balance of the body, the more you consciously go towards gratitude in your life and try to make peace with life and let go of expectations, that helps the body get in that right rhythm, which helps the brain think better and have, have better perspectives. And so the positive feedback loop keeps on going. Now we're human, so shit happens, <laughs> and, and life intervenes, and you got to deal with curveballs all the time. But if you have that foundation of, oh yeah, I can go for that positive feedback loop, and I can build the kind of neural circuitry to support that, then that's kind of what hard math's been about. So hard math is both a set of techniques that are very practical and easy to apply and easy to bring right into your daily life, and it's technology. It's got several different biofeedback type technologies that it's innovated and won a bunch of awards for, which allow your computer or your iPhone or your Android or whatever to become like a little feedback tool for you. So our is kind of all that. And it's a ton of research. And so, you know, I'll be anywhere in the world and people will literally kind of like bow to me and saying, not just to me, but like, thank you. Thank you to HeartMath for doing all this hard clinical work that helped all of us who believe in these concepts. You, you've given us some a foundation now of, yep, there's something to this after all. It's not just a nice feeling. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And uh, how about with you personally? You had a personal experience with it as well as obviously professionally you've used these techniques, but it helped your health as well. Yeah, you can say I had a personal experience <laughs> with it. I'm only laughing because uh, the experience continues. Um, yeah, I was diagnosed with cancer uh, about nine years ago, and uh, surgery got the tumor, which was great. It was, unfortunately, it was a bit big. But then the treatments that followed uh, to make sure I wouldn't get it again started giving me staph infections. The staph got in my blood. Uh, that's a life-threatening condition, um, which I had acquired somehow in the hospital or at the doctor's office. And uh, obviously, I'm, I'm free of all of that. I'm, as of yesterday, I had another checkup, nine years cancer-free, eight years staph infection-free. Also, I had to have my, both my hips replaced because um, partly stress, but partly when I was a teenager, I was diagnosed with scoliosis. And uh, after leading an extremely active life, being slightly off, off whack um, because the scoliosis finally caught up with my hips and and they got pretty severely arthritic and finally needed to have them, um, have them both replaced. In this period of time, which was less than two years, my mother all, also passed away and my marriage dissolved. Other than that, you know, kind of a walk in the park, you know, whistling, whistling happy to me every day. So it was pretty challenging, obviously, and there were some many dark nights of the soul, let alone dark nights in hospitals. And uh, so it was not a fun time. Um, and at the same time, um, I never fully lost hope because I had, I had built enough kind of inner resilience, inner, inner resources were in me so deep from the heart math work, from teaching it all over the world, let alone practicing it every day for years. Uh, and many times in, after coming out of a procedure or coming out of the hospital, someone would say to me, wow, you're looking so much better than I was expecting. And it was sort of sort of this backhanded compliment, like, well, how bad did you think I was going to look? <laughs> because I don't exactly feel great right now. But the message kept being, you have more resilience than the average person to have gone through all that and to still be healthy and thriving. And, you know, I turned 65 a couple of weeks ago, and people are pretty shocked usually when they hear that number, especially because I'm dancing and I'm singing. I just released an album of original songs, and I'm very active and blah, 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 blah. So I, I kind of... So it was uh, when I laughed on when you said you, you've had an experience with the tools. Yeah, for about 25 years now. And um, and it's it, it continues to impress me the value of the practice, uh, both to, to on the obvious physical levels of enabling the body to rebound and recover and, and heal. But also just from the standpoint of staying young in our attitudes, mm -hmm. staying young in our approach to life, because life Life's pretty crazy in case you haven't noticed lately and uh, getting weirder. And how do you stay somewhat sane and not just a raving maniac in rebellion over what's going on? Uh, there's some of that. But, you know, how do you contribute to the world as well as rail against what's the, the horrible stuff going on? So it's, it's an interesting challenge. But heart math is absolutely at the core of, of my practice and um, uh, it will, will always be the heart central. 
That's amazing. I'm just uh, happened for our book club. We're reading the untethered soul, kind of a, almost a ca classic. And he's talking about um, the energy within that's beyond the physical body. You know, the, the body uh, you can nourish or not nourish or sleep or not sleep. And you can still have energy, whether you are depleted of food and, and, uh, and sleep. And where does that energy come from? And he talks a lot about it, the heart opening. So that kind of resilience, um, you know, maybe, I don't know if you can talk a little bit about the energy that, that actually that comes from within. Maybe we talk a little bit about the chi and some different religion, religious practices, but the heart coherence, the heart-mind coherence is one thing, but there's also a sense of energy that's come that's, I don't know, universal energy, the Taurus energy. Is there anything about that that relates to some of the work that's been done with HeartMath? Absolutely, and and it also relates to kind of where a lot of my work is going now, okay. and uh, which is around the area of creativity and and kind of accepting that we are all innately creative beings, mm -hmm. whether we are artistic or not is not the point. The point my my uh, thesis or my theory, which I think is not a theory, I think it's just a fact. <laughs> but we like many facts that happen. It takes a while before we recognize that's actually a fact. It's not just somebody's opinion. And the fact that I believe is a fact is that we are all innately creative or we wouldn't have the power to create life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The creative energy is alive in every single freaking human being, whether we want to believe it or not, whether we want to believe, oh, I'm not artistic because my parents told me I'm not, <clears throat> or I can't sing, I can't paint because my teacher told me I can't, or, or whatever, or I'm not good at, at, at certain aspects of business because my boss only wants me to stick to my admin job. Well, okay, that's a lot of negativity you had to deal with, but that isn't necessarily true either. And so my, my, my view is that we are all constantly creating our bodies are creating we're building new cells all the time even what we used to think was late in life we're continuing to create new brain cells mm -hmm. let alone new thoughts let alone new feelings let alone the biochemistry associated all, with all that i've used the phrase we are cauldrons of creativity cauldrons i mean there's always creation going on inside of us and yet a lot of us say, but that's not creative. That's like, okay, you're doing a play on words now. Because like, <laughs> creativity would have to be like being a writer or being a poet or being an artist or something like that. So, well, that's artistic. That's, that's a way creativity can be expressed. But what about the person in most businesses that is the one you go to because they're the problem solver? They're the one. Let's talk to Jim. He'll, figure, he'll help us figure out how to deal with that one. Well, that may be the most creative person in your, in your company. Because not because they are artistic or can sing a tune or dance dance like Fred Astaire. <clears throat> wow, did I date myself when I said Fred Astaire? How about uh, how about Bruno Mars? I'll update it a little bit. Uh, so creativity again, I, I distinguish creativity from artistic expression. Uh, artistic expression are way are ways creativity can be expressed, but. but for me, and I think I've, I've mentioned this to you previously, Leanne, um, as, as we said, I just uh, eight months ago moved to New York. Last year was an amazing year because I produced my first album of original songs with these two rock stars who were my collaborators and my, my, my gurus, and they were amazing partners in the process. And so that was like a big deal for the year was, was everything that went into the creation of that, Indiegogo campaign, websites, on and on, launch concerts and in Sausalito, the Carol came to in New York City, blah, blah, blah. My biggest creative challenge was a 3,000 mile relationship with a woman from an entirely different culture than what I was raised in, who was a generation younger than me. That was my creative challenge. <laughs> yes, there was some actual creative stuff. We danced sometimes. We had we had this shared beauty of uh, love of nature. So we, have, we love to take pictures of amazing nature together. But um, that was the biggest creative challenge. So for me, exploring and embracing the, the the uniqueness to each of our create, own innate creativity is to me kind of the next frontier mm -hmm. that that's it's, it's huge to be able to recognize that we have within us the power to solve every single problem you know when i think when you hear my story my quote story you know that two-year period that was pretty rough and that and then i'll have an issue with a rental car company or i'll have an issue with 
somebody that's on my team on a project that I'm working on, and I'll, I'll be like all caught up in the emotion of it. And I'm thinking, okay, dude, my higher self will step in and say, dude, you have gotten past cancer, staph infections, the death of your mother, the loss of your marriage. You left an organization you helped to build for 25 years. You've, and you're thriving. So this email is throwing you off. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> that's the best we can do. It makes us realize we're human still. You gotta give me some more than that because you've already proven you can conquer all this other stuff. So like this yeah. email should be throwing you. You're really, you're really better than that. Very cool. So how did you kind of shift? I mean, obviously you had some major changes in your life and, and so forth, but how did you end up kind of shifting into this more creative area? Because you, um, you did a project before that, Make Your Heart Sing, and now you're in this a new project. Can you could take us through a little bit? I know your background was more in the creative and, and the artistic endeavors as well. So can you just t tell us a little bit about that shift in your life in terms of your work and your career? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it was evolving. So when I started, when I was, my first career was I was an actor, singer, dancer on Broadway in New York City. And it was a very heady time, very exciting time. It was, the, it was the seventies and I absolutely loved it. And I had never wanted to do that though. As a kid, I did not ever dream of being an actor, a singer or a dancer. The last thing I thought I would ever do. So when I found myself doing it and being quite successful at it and getting all kinds of work at it and then, and then start to notice, you know, I feel like I've kind of done it. I've, I've had my five years here. I feel like I need to move on to something totally different and did and got moved to California and got into spiritual growth and health and well-being and all the things that I've done over the last 35 or four or more years. Um, it all felt right. But then as life was getting darker in that period of my health uh, uh, shrinking, <laughs> the diminishment of me, which was what it felt was going on, um, more and more I started to recognize I'm not doing anything creative anymore. Now I'm CEO of this amazing company, but I'm mainly managing meetings and managing things. And I'm not the one involved in the creating of a website or a brochure or a program. I've got people for that. <laughs> and they are great people. They were better at me, better than me at a lot of that. And yet to not have that outlet was killing me. And we had a band at HeartMath for 10 years. And then for various reasons, the band disbanded. And I was part of the band. I played bongos and conga. I, I sang. It was an extremely fun outlet for the creative side. And that went away. So all these things that I had been doing for years to kind of keep the creative fire burning, one by one, they were, they were gone through no fault of anyone. But it was just kind of, I was letting go or, or things were, were disappearing. And somehow in the midst of all these challenges, it kind of hit me. I'm not doing anything creative. When I was dealing with the staph infections in my blood for six hours every day, I had to, for six weeks, I had to infuse strong antibiotic into my blood. And I would like, okay, what can I do creatively <laughs> while I have to sit here with the tube for three hours? And I would, thanks to Steve Jobs and the smartphone and having a cool camera in my smartphone, I started taking pictures of things. And more and more I got into taking, doing photography to inspire myself and discovered, wow, other people are inspired. They don't know, I'm, I've got a, a tube in my arm when I'm taking these pictures, but I do. And that became a way to inspire myself. So um, I think I'm getting off from your question, kind of back into my story a little bit too much, but the, the, the point of, of kind of finding ways to re-inspire myself became very important. And, and I realized the photography was just one aspect of the creativity that I was missing. And then um, I got invited to a concert in Washington, D.C., which was a Christmas carol sing-along concert. It was a life-changing experience to sing Christmas carols with 2,000 total strangers. And within a month, I was rehearsing on weekends with my dear friend, Gary Malkin. A month after that, we created this project called What Makes Your Heart Sing, which became what we call a keynote performance, where we talked about our stories and how we both had, had overcome very serious challenges. And we're now using things we love, like music and dance, to, to, to inspire others. So once that turned back on, it's like it couldn't turn off. Mm -hmm. And then it just was kind of ramping up more and more. And then these guys invited me to do an album with them, pay them a lot of money. And I said yes to that. And I thought that's going to be a whole other adventure of creativity because this is me. Fundamentally, I am a creative person. I love business. I love to mentor. I love to help companies work and grow and all that. And I find that very creatively fulfilling and challenging. But if I don't do things that are really creative, like I'm creating a concert right now and I'm performing next month in New York City. And so being involved in rehearsals, 
and thinking through the sequence of an evening. And I love that. I, I can live. I live for that. So um, for part of it for me is simply being, I am fundamentally a creative person. If I'm not doing a variety of artistic things and creative things, I, life is dry and I get sick. Mm -hmm. And so it's pretty obvious. So I just decided I want, this is my mission to help people awaken that in them too. Because whether, like I said earlier, whether you're artistic or not, it's, uh, it's that energy I want to help inspire. That's really, really important. And, uh, and, and, and the fact that each one of us needs that. It nourishes us. It energizes. It keeps us young. It, it, it puts um, energy and wisdom and creativity and everything into our work that helps us to innovate. Um, there's a, an amazing book uh, by Bill Plotkin called uh, The Human uh, the soul and what is it nature and the human soul nature and the human soul and he talks about kind of different stages of our soul's evolution and in particular kind of late adulthood into elderhood so to speak and it's not based on an age it's more about our soul you know first is apprenticing what our soul's expression is whatever that might be you know and and you know for you and me and, and many people on here it's a combination of different things you know like jared who worked at you know in legal profession and then mindfulness or doris and coaching and children and that type of thing and so then we apprentice all that and then we get to more of an artisan level of our soul expression and that's where we really he talks about renaissance um cultural renaissance happens the most at that stage of our soul's evolution our soul's expression through life so that's where we bring back to our society and our culture new ideas new things and so it's that creative energy that does that but it's based on a lot of already experience that we already have you know it sounds like very much that's what that where you're playing it's really cool well, I love that he uses the word renaissance, as, as, we, as you said earlier in the introduction. Um, I've been pl people who started calling me a renaissance man a few years ago, and I thought, I've never thought of that in, in terms of me. And then I thought, well, it's because I've never had it integrated before. I've never like, done all of it at, kind of at the same time. And, but now I have the freedom to do that, and I've just said I'm doing it. <laughs> Whether it all makes money is not even the point. I've got to I've got to be as fully myself as I can be, and uh, so I, then I switched it because man felt like a very old fashioned term. So I, that's why I call it Renaissance human. But it, and it's, and now the challenge we have in contrast to 100 years ago or 500 years ago is the is how we deal with it, with technology and things like AI and things like privacy issues at a time when we're trying to also be fully ourselves, be all the aspects of ourselves that are innate in us. So that's what Renaissance Human is sort of all about, is kind of creating a movement to say, no matter where we are in life, no matter what we've gone through, there are parts of ourselves that need re rebirth. In some cases, it's going back to things we loved when we were young, and we just let it go for whatever reasons. We need time to dust it off, or time to re-energize it, or give it new birth, or whatever. In other, kind, in other, in other times, it's time to, to learn new parts of ourselves we've just never gotten into and and, and they're untold stories to be told uh, yet with that through that part of ourselves so the, the or, your new organization renaissance human it is uh is it a mentoring or is it like a production where you're producing albums or is it very broad open supportive inspiring how does it work how does that organization work the, the latter <laughs> uh, is sort of it's, it's pretty open-ended at this point the reason a year ago i was in the middle of an indiegogo campaign for the album apologies for that no worries um let me shut the darn thing off i thought it was off already um yeah so when i started with uh with this uh, this concept of of Renaissance Human and the Indiegogo campaign was a chance to build a community around it. So I had a few hundred people that contributed to this album and to the and therefore to the launch events and the website and all and, and everything else. And really, my goal is to bring together people that share this inspiration, this idea that we are being human means we are creative. It's not that just some people got the creative gene. Some people got the artistic gene or genes. But that doesn't mean they're the creative ones and, and all the rest of us are just accountants. <laughs> you know, we're all creative. That's who we are. And finding, believing that and finding how it can uniquely express is the fun part. So 
Renaissance Human ultimately is a network of, of that. Now it's a bunch of people that are that have helped me with different projects, and and so pe- pretty much everybody I affiliate with loves this idea in some way and kind of wants to be connected to it because who wouldn't? You know, it's kind of a yeah. the, the, what makes us uniquely human. And you have a very large network. I I saw in your bio is 150,000 people strong when growing, which is really amazing. And that's some of the benefits of social media and technology too. So you're leveraging that really well. Uh, Despite, you know, I find so many people I meet, 50 plus, that have so much trouble with technology and say, no, 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 I'm not going to use technology. (laughs) And then here's a perfect example of how it's really well served you, right? Yeah, well, and, you know, I'm I'm pretty pretty tech savvy. I'm not a tech guy, but I, I, I tend to not be afraid of it. I tend to, you know, if something's going wrong, I, my attitude tends to be, let's figure this out. <laughs> a lot, a lot of people Typical might. guy, right? <laughs> uh, well, except anything non-techy, I'm like lousy at. Okay. I'm not a fixer. Okay. My girlfriend is like, how come you can't do that? You're a man. I said, because I'm more artistic. I can, let me write something about it. I'm, I, I can do that really well. Um, so I'm not, not necessarily oriented that way like a lot of guys are. But um, with technology, for some reason, it just never scared me. So I'm just like, let's keep going. Restart if you have to. Let's just keep going. This, this, that's sort of my approach to life, too. So, so, but I think with, with social media, what's wild is that, um, I mean, I have on my team, in the main, main project I'm on now, the social media person for my team it lives in Thailand. The, the person doing the book trailer lives in New Zealand. The person doing video production for us is in Toronto. The author is in Beirut, Lebanon. The gentleman doing the business plan for us is, is in Malaga, Spain. Wow. So we have Zoom calls, <laughs> thanks to Zoom, like bringing us, making us a little village of all those parts of the world at the same time. It's pretty wild that technology can do that, that we're able to do that. We're able to create an amazing thing with all these diverse people mm-hmm. all working together around a common goal. So to me, there's a cool thing about technology, but but it's 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 it, it, it wants to wrap its tentacles around us in every way it can so we so we can't you know, can't, can't can't live without it so i think that's the challenge of life one of the challenges of life today is being fully ourselves without this you know just con- constantly relying on technology for to feed us mm-hmm. let alone to, to be like a chain around our, our ankles yeah, and I think everyone on this call and probably people listen after are very much uh, very cognizant and very aware of that and trying to bring that into their practice and into their families as well. So I'm gonna, I have another question for you, but I'm going to just uh, ask people to think about if you have any question, you can, uh, you can put um, uh, it in the chat or uh, I'll give you some time to actually ask Bruce directly. And so just to give yourself some time to think of um, anything that you have uh, that's been bubbling up, I have a question actually that I want to ask that Linda mentioned to me this morning and talk about Zoom as being cool. Like here, she's in her farm right now. She's a, you can see that she's outside and we have people from California and other people in their offices or home offices. And it's really amazing what we're able to do now and to have this kind of conversation we've never been able to before. My question is, um, how does... How does your training in heart math and all that you've learned there relate to this new, not new, the direction that you're going now on the creativity? Where's the big kind of intersection for you or is there one do you see? Absolutely, I, I, I see it. And when I leave these courses, whether it's Stanford or I was at this retreat center over the weekend teaching at a place called 1440 Multiversity, which is this new, very high-end. Yes, I'm a very, kind of kind of, yeah. kind of Esalen with a lot more money yes. um, uh, program. And um, part of what I get at in this approach that I've adopted is that, first of all, what's getting in the way of our, our own creativity? And for, for most people, the number one thing is some form of fear, if not a multi-headed form of fear and so getting in touch with that is part of the process you know what let let that let that fear voice speak and what's it telling you elizabeth gilbert in her book big magic which i quote a lot and i love her work and i had a chance to meet her and actually go through a workshop with her on creativity based on the book big magic uh, she has a marvelous way of dealing with fear and i kind of bring that into this to, to the work that i do because to me, uh, there's so many things, so many tapes in our head, so many old neural circuits that can block us from 
going for it, creatively speaking. And that's got to be dealt with. And, and so that's kind of relates to heart math too, that if you're, you know, whatever the stressful emotion is, anxiety, fear, anger, whatever, that's going to hold you back physiologically, let alone mentally and emotionally from being the best version of yourself that you can be. So that's an obvious tie in. And another one that I, that I use a lot in the work is that, that like we were talking about earlier, positive emotions, bring all kinds of benefit into the heart and therefore the brain, but also biochemically. So the, 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 the biochemistry of stress ages us and is useful if it's real danger, but it's uh, harmful when it's chronic and when there's not really real danger. And so learning to identify the quote negative emotions and learning to shift them into more of a positive state underpins creativity. When I'm teaching these classes, I'm saying, what do you love to do, creatively speaking? Let's focus on that, because when you're doing something that you love to do, the science is quite clear. Loving what you're doing is like the, the best thing for your body. It, 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 it does stop the aging clock there, at least for a while, if not, if not long term. Mm -hmm. So to, be, to have things in your life that just get those creative juices going and just for their own sake are fulfilling, whether anybody ever sees it or not, it's not the point. Just to take that photo and to look at how you capture that and think, that's a bitchin' photo. I did a good job of that. <laughs> not out of ego, but just out of the, the, I can do that. That's what a cool feeling that is. So that's absolutely tied to heart mass work about positive emotion is, is the refreshment, it's the elixir that we often need to deal with the stresses of life. So there's, and there's more than those pieces, but to me, all that I'm doing now, if I wasn't, if, there's no way it couldn't be connected to heart math, both because I was part of it for so long, but because the work is so fundamental, in my view, to how the human system really functions. So I'm just kind of taking in a, in, a, in a direction, kind of the next step for me was creativity because that's who I am and I need to do it myself. And a lot of people are saying, thank you for, for going through all that shit you went through because, because you're, now you can, can, can inspire us. So. Uh, that is a, that's really amazing. And it's, um, Sharon just came on and she's my uh, co-host uh, retreats that we do in Costa Rica. And this weekend we're doing one up north. She's a holistic natural path. And, and uh, that's where um, our, our work together we're doing this weekend is going to be a lot around, you know, what are the stressors in your life? you know, relating to some of the core wounds and fear, using mindfulness, but also using some of the wonder, awe of appreciation, gratitude, and creativity, and connection to nature to help us move into more of those positive states. So uh, thank you for that. And I think we'll probably use some heart math uh, techniques as well that we've learned along the way as well. So that's really awesome. I'm going to just open it up. I have a couple more questions, but I want to open it up to the group if anybody has a question. Raise your hand literally or figuratively in the, <laughs> there's a raise your hand button here. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to ask Bruce about any of his work, uh, heart math, the, the, um, the, uh, his Renaissance Human Project or anything in particular. One of the things that um, I'd love to just mention too about Linda mentioned is to me this morning I was at her farm because my son works with her there and uh, she talks about the, her recognition of the heart energy of the horse whose heart is much bigger. So the energy field is quite a lot, a lot larger, and I thought that was really interesting. Did you ever do any work with animals or uh, with regard to the heart itself or heart coherence and with heart math? You're asking me? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I have not directly done that, um, although an interesting thing that I noticed was I never grew up with animals. Um, we had no dogs or cats as a family. Um, my brothers had some some ducks at one point. I had a, I had a, some hamsters um, and some and some tropical fish, you know, but no real pets. And and as a result, I was always a bit afraid of them, especially dogs. I had a cousin with a, a, a scary little French poodle that traumatized me when I was eleven. <laughs> it took me a long time to get over it. Why I'm sharing all that is that um, later in life, like in the last ten or fifteen years, I realized, God, I still had this sort of I'm wary around animals, especially big dogs. And what if I kind of use the power of the heart to help create a connection with animals? Mm -hmm. And I've had, I can't tell you how many times now I've been in a situation and instead of the old kind of slightly wary or afraid attitude I would have, I would just enter the room feeling loving towards that animal 
And the owner would say, she never does that. She is so friendly. She, you must, she, she really likes you. She's never this way. I keep, I've, I keep hearing this. I'm thinking that's really interesting because I still, I still don't have a living relationship with a pet. I've never had that. And yet now animals seem to come to me in a way. And I know I was putting out an energy of like, stay away for a long time. Yeah. So that was sort of my own little experiment. If you will. Our math, they're on the website. When you, when you brought up horses on the website, and I know there have been many examples of equine trainers that use heart math consciously either for themselves or for others that are working with horses or learning to be friendly with horses, knowing that it's the human that's got to get their act together because the horse is highly sensitive and highly warm-hearted usually. And so if, that, if, the, if the damn humans can get their act together and, and trust and be loving, everything's going to be pretty cool. There's a lot of, a lot of study. Actually, yeah, yeah. This is exactly right, Linda. Yeah, she's being she's being shy there, um, but that's okay. That's awesome. So when you come up to uh, Montreal next, I know you were here a couple of years ago uh, visiting with um, Julianne Kristoff, who many of us online here know well. Um, that's who introduced us, actually, Bruce to. Uh, uh, was introduced by Jack, and so next time you come up, you'll have to come out to her stables and and connect with the horses. So I wanted to, Jared has an excellent question, and I know it's a question that I often ask, and I think Sharon would probably uh, like to to ask this one too, maybe. And so uh, Jared, do you want to just say it yourself rather than me reading it? Because it's um, it's I love to hear your voice. <laughs> okay, so I just need to make sure you're unmuted. So let me just, I think you have to unmute yourself there, Jared. Awesome. Okay. Sure. I'm happy to say it myself, but um, when you opened it up to questions, I was about 85% the way done. And I was like, I'm just going to finish this because I don't think I can say it nearly as effectively as I wrote it. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I'm happy to share it. So first of all, Bruce, thank you. This is really amazing stuff and it's really landing and your heart energy feels so good. And I'm really loving this. So thank you. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. Yeah. So the question I asked in probably way more eloquent terms was, um, what are your thoughts and feelings, any guidance you can offer on the relationship between creativity and short-term crisis? you know, death of a loved one, loss of relationship, um, you know, loss of career, plummeting of uh, reputation, whatever it is, one of the life crises. And uh, the interplay between maybe using stress, uh, using creativity as a short-term coping mechanism, as a purposeful tool to ascend from and shift out of that dark space um, versus kind of not rushing the process of the pain and the healing and maybe knowing when it's time to just um, allow ourselves to not be in a creative mode and just sit with the pain and uh, maybe the lack of creativity and then wait for the organic return of creativity. So I'd love your thoughts on that balance. Mm, that's such a great question. That's something that I struggle with a lot. Wow, that's, that's a deep, deep, deep question, Jared. Thank you so much for asking that. I feel like I'd love to have a you know, let's, let's, grab a, let's grab a coffee and spend a couple of hours talking about that one. Um, so deep. And I guess it's, I love that. It's so individual to every situation and every person and where they're at in their life. And I think, I think the, the, you had, there was truth in everything that you said. I mean, I, I feel like when I look at times when I've had tragedy, I've lost both parents, I've lost two brothers, I've you know, lost relationships. Uh, you know, uh, when I left the HeartMath group, the CEO job, I really also stepped away from the management of the whole organization and became more of a kind of a friend. Uh, you know, still do a lot with it, but in some ways, I was I agree I had to grieve that because I realized for the next phase of my life, I needed to be more my own person, not, not to just be individually famous. That wasn't what I'm after, or I would, or I would be more famous. <laughs> but um, but rather, I needed to kind of. Is, what do I really feel in, in all that I've learned in my life, even before the years of heart math? So, so I face grief in lots of ways, and I think, I think the, the being able to sit with it and to really acknowledge how you do feel is is critical, and, and that shouldn't be bypassed and shouldn't be skipped through or or feel like well we got to we got to get on with it. On the other hand, sometimes there life you can't just kind of put all of life on hold. Some some things kind of need to keep moving because of certain responsibilities or just people that are in your life. And 
when I was, you know, kind of in this aftermath of all the stuff that I went through, and when we created this, this movement called What Makes Your Heart Sing, one of the elements that we talked about and how important it is relative to b- being able to be inspired was the quality of playfulness. That, you know, one of the things that's so wonderful about children is their ability to not hang on to things sometimes, just kind of bounce back quick and get back into playing on the playground again. And there's something to be said for that kind of resilience. And so to me, it's like, I think you don't, you don't want to use that instead of staying with the deeper feelings, but sometimes the feelings kind of need a break too. And our, our soul is all of it. Our soul can be playful. And, and, and even, you know, all funerals are not somber. Many of them are celebrations mm-hmm. as well. And so I think it's like finding what, what feels right because you, and that's a moment by moment question, a moment by moment decision, not a, well, here's at a certain point, start telling jokes, you know, obviously I'm being facetious about that, but you know, it's not like there's a certain prescription in my view, but rather what feels right now. And sometimes doing something lighthearted, not only can kind of be uplifting and, but also can sometimes release a deeper level of grief that needs to let go. It's like in the, in the joy, it's like it hits you. Oh God, I miss her. Mm. And, and you need to, you needed to kind of hit that. And sometimes it's the playfulness or the, sweetness that can get you into that deeper that deeper feeling of let go does that make sense it's, it's really complex stuff to put into human language and i think you know i know, it. I know. I know. it really does and i would love to take you up on that because i know it's hard to put all that into a short <laughs> sound bite like that so i'm up in san francisco you know um from time to time and also new york it sounds like you're in new york so i'll be there next month so maybe we can me for that cup of coffee because I'd love to hear more of it. You know, I can tell you have a cauldron on this one, so I'd love to hear the. Cauldron. That's a, that's awesome, and I, if I could just add, I, I I found the same thing. You know, it's an iterative process; it's not a linear. So you you know have to go through the healing, then you can get to the creative. It's it's back and forth. And when I lost my husband, uh, I would see the kids. You talk about the resilience. They they would sit with something, and then they like, okay, I need to play. You know, like. There were some really serious, tough times when their father was sick, and then when he was dying, and then when he died, and then the few, you know, and then you could just see they would hit their max, and then they would be like, okay, I need to go, I, I need to play, I need to do something else. And for me, um, my way of doing that was my work. I love. I was creating, designing transformation. I was shifting. I was looking into what, and so I would kind of find my way through that, and then come back out, and then there'd be different layers of of healing and and sitting with the pain that would happen, you know. So. Thank you for sharing that. I re- that's, a, that's a really tough question. And, and sometimes a lot of people that follow law of attraction and everything, it's like just ignore all that's bad and go to the light. And I think that that misses the wholeness of who we are, right, and, uh, and the, all parts of it. But there's other people that get very much about only in the dark and the shadow, and they don't recognize those positive um, emotions can really help us heal. They're like a bomb for our soul when we're going through the really difficult things. So thank you for that. Is there any other uh, uh, comments, questions anyone wanted to add here? I saw in the chat uh, from... Oh, from Heather. Yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, from Heather about this connection between resilience and, <clears throat> and creativity. Um, I, think, I think there's, a, to me, a huge potential connection there. And I, I, partly going back to the sort of the biochemistry of both, that resilience in my experience and in my studies, thanks to HeartMath, is absolutely related to our ability to move through stressful situations and keep keep finding gratitude where it would be hard, keep going to neutral where all that we can feel is anger, you know, doing things that are changing our biochemistry from, that it's easy to get stuck in the anger and the fear and the overwhelm. But of course, all of those things deplete our resilience like crazy. And so what boosts the resilience is the, are, are the positive attitudes that, you know what, I've been through way worse than this. You know what, there's people on the planet right now that would love to be ha- having to deal with this problem now. <laughs> you know, like there, there can be those perspectives that, that kind of boost us out of, of feeling sorry for oneself or self-pity or whatever that instantly kind of changes the biochemistry and therefore it's like topping up the resilience a little bit. And so, so that's just, to me, just one aspect of why we want to be resilient and, and kind of how you get there. 
And part of it too is that creativity, anytime we're doing something that's creatively satisfying, whether anyone ever sees it or not, or hears it or not, or reads it or not, or sees it or views it or not, isn't the point. Because when we're doing something that is a, we've gotten in the flow to do, and it's, and it's satisfying and we're loving. I mean, when I, when I found the portrait mode on my iPhone, <laughs> those of you know that use the camera at all, it's like a whole new world emerged. And now I take photos in a whole other way. And I can't tell you how exciting that is when I see a flower and I have portrait mode now. <laughs> I can really make that photo, that, that flower jump out like, wow, look at that. That's awesome. You know, so that moment biologically has shifted me dramatically from whatever I was just feeling. Biologically has shifted me. So the, the act of doing that, that creative act and then celebrating it and then feeling the joy, enjoyment of like, that was cool. That is producing the same effect for your, your resilience. So to me, there's, they're all related. And, they're, and therefore, the more resilience we have, that isn't just kind of biochemical energy, although that's part of it, but it's also attitudes that we are able to fall back on that, okay, this isn't the end of the world. I know it feels like it right now, but it really isn't. And so having that perspective tends to lead to, well, then what are we going to do about it? There's got to be a solution. We've had way worse problems. There's got to be, we've got to figure this out. We will. And so there's, then there's that access to a creative idea that we might not have had, or man, I'm, I'm stumped. Let's call, let's call Betty. <laughs> let's call, let's call her. She's going to know what to do. You know, you, you've got the presence of mind to say, I can't figure this out by myself, but I don't have to, I got friends. So to me, it, it, they're absolutely linked and it's, it is a positive feedback loop. So however, however you can be creative, do it, um, take, do, do the things that you already know, build your resilience, do that. Cause that's going to feed the creative side too. And so to me, it is, a, it is a self um, perpetuating positive cycle. Beautiful. That's wonderful. <laughs> Heather, do you have any, anything more to add to that? Did you want it? No, that's awesome. Does anyone else have a question? Or Sharon, Linda? I, I have another question for you before we finish. And it relates to organizations, because you've worked with uh, solo entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs within organizations, corporate, uh, you're working in a university organization, um, healthcare. Do you, and and you're, you've had a lot of experience in California, which is more ahead than most places in the world. How do you, how are you seeing the shift in terms of wellness in the workplace? Some of these concepts of mindfulness, heart math, some of those concepts, some of the creativity, the things that you've learned, you've experienced, that you're teaching. How receptive do you find organizations, or do you see a certain type that are more receptive than others to bringing uh, these concepts in, to being taught them, to and engage, um, really um, engaging these these ideas? Yeah. Well, I have the benefit of years, meaning I've been at this a long time. So it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's, it's quite cool, frankly, that today uh, there's so much more receptivity. I mean, I remember when mindfulness what even was beginning to be a thing. And now it's, I mean, not just in California, but especially California, uh, but so many places, I mean, mindfulness is just kind of it's quite accepted. And I think it's, it's been packaged in a fairly Western way. It's in a fairly scientific way, especially the MBSR kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So to me, there's a dramatic shift. And it's just keep a momentum that just keeps going up. It's more like a, almost a hockey stick curve. It feels like in the, in California companies, I mean, if you're not very sophisticated and offering wellness things, people will go somewhere else. There's a, there's, there's competition around how, how many benefits around wellness and well being can we, can we offer? Because there's an expectation out here that, what do you mean you don't have a wellness program? <laughs> what? You find it what, different what, in New York? What, well, in New York, less so. I mean, I, and I'm, I'm just coming back to New York, mm -hmm. so I don't yeah. feel a great feeling yet. And I, I don't know, know the market nearly as well as I did. California and heart math, we tended to find the more progressive companies because they'd find us. And so we, we would be working with people well, like Stanford. Stanford's had their own extremely sophisticated employee wellness program for like 35 years. And they're extremely proud of that. So they, it's amazing how much they put into it cost wise and benefit wise. So, but that's California, that's Stanford. So um, I think it, there's been an, an obvious shift in that direction. That's, I, I don't think we'll get turned back really no matter what's happening in the macro about healthcare and who's running it and who's killing it. <laughs> There's, if anything, it's only, it's only going to increase. And part of that's because the baby boomers are really facing 
the hard, cold reality of, of not paying attention to it enough in their earlier years. So now it's hitting them if it didn't before. So that's part of what's, what's going to drive it. And there's just a lot much. The millennials who are not accepting, you know, the way of, of the, of the past of a more mechanistic kind of approach to work and, and that type of thing. So there's kind of, a they're, whole they're, thing, huh? they see their, they see their parents as the cautionary tale. Yes. And they're saying, I'm not going to do what they did and kind of waited till they retired to kind of finally address being balanced and being the fullness of who they are. Sorry, I can't wait till that, that that's a little risky to me. Yeah. So that's a good, that's a good pressure. I think in the society to, to embrace um, more of these holistic concepts. Very good. I just uh, take one more um, question from Linda here, and it kind of builds on on what uh, the question that Jared had. So it's the idea that moving into creativity too quickly, could it be, could it challenge, um, could it be actually like an escape or defense mechanism? And, or does it, uh, is it an opportunity to go deeper into self-knowledge? So that's uh, that's a kind of hard question, but it's it's kind of what's on people's mind about that. How much to say in the shadow? How much to move into the light? You know? Do you have any more to add to that? Yeah, I think it's just it's beautifully put. I mean, I think that's the that's the question that every individual would face, depending upon that situation and where they're at, even in their life journey up till that situation. So, in other words, you could have this you could have this horrific loss at a time. When you were at your at your peak, you were like everything was going great, and suddenly this thing, oh my God, the bottom's just falling out. But you've got a lot of resilience. You you you're doing great in other ways. You could also hit a point of grief at your lowest, where it's like, oh my God, not that now. You know where it's like really devastating. So there's and and, and anything in between. So I am absolutely in favor of of using opportunities for deep self knowledge. The example I gave earlier of sometimes embracing something that's more playful as another doorway to the deeper acceptance is something I've found in my own life. Many a time, I, I dance. I'm a dancer. I'd never imagined I would dance again when I had two titanium uh, hips put in, but I can dance like I'm 30. And thank God I can dance again because many times I've been on the dance floor, not consciously even focusing on something that may have been lost in my life, but it will emerge in the process of dancing. And I'm so grateful that I've shed those tears and had a chance to find that deeper level that I, that, that I wasn't doing on my own because I am super busy and aren't we all? And so thank God for other forms of expression that can be the doorway. So in the middle of some amazing song, all of a sudden I feel this wave of, grief about about her <laughs> and oh, wow okay let go to that you know so i i think that's a, a, a terrific question and again such an individual case of, of the situation and hue and where you're at and when so I, I i'm not advocating trying to move too quickly through anything but at the same time recognize we are all of these parts of ourselves so even in the grief that doesn't mean we couldn't um, still laugh about something and that that couldn't help us in that process. Mm. I think that's the insight, but not to use it as an escape or not to use it as just the, the easy way out of, well, we're not going to go deeper. So let's just kind of keep it light and all that. I'm, I'm, yeah, I think you can figure out by now that's not who I am. I would want to go deep, mm -hmm. but I want to do it in as warm hearted and inclusive a way as I could. You know, it's just. Excellent warm. answer. Really, really well uh, summarized, Bruce. Thank you so much. So just uh, as, as kind of we're parting, um, is there anything that um, you, you would like to share? And is maybe anything where you're, where you're going towards with your work, in particular with the Renaissance Human Project, anything else you would like to share with us that I haven't asked you about already? Well, this, this album, I'll give a little plug for the album, Renaissance Human is the name of the album. And it's on iTunes, it's on Spotify, Amazon, you know, done dozens of digital record uh, uh, online online sites, Renaissance Human. For those of you who, who like autobiographical music, which most is, <laughs> um, it, most of the lyrics are, are personal um, to, to some degree. Some are more, you know, cute and personal. But uh, it's a it was a great project to do. So that's something if, if people are curious about, well, what is, can he even sing? You know, is the music any good? Check it out. 
that those are the places you can check it out. And, you know, I, I don't have any quote public offerings right now that I'm doing, you know, so uh, I still work one-on-one -on -one with people here and there, mostly entrepreneurs and, and people running mostly health related enterprises or, or at least spiritual and health or something like that. But no, I think it's just, I think it's a time for collaboration. It's a time to, um, let go of our assumptions and expectations we've had on ourselves of how life is supposed to be and who we were supposed to be. And like, okay, well, it, if that hasn't worked, then now would be the time to kind of try to let go. Yeah. And uh, I have found in the last two years more opportunities to let go than in the previous 63 put together. And um, I think that's a lot of what's allowed me to at a time when most people are slowing down, decide why not move to New York and move in with the, with a woman 27 years younger than me and who's from Russia and is a Pilates instructor. And because like, maybe that would be your next challenge. And yeah, <laughs> I love it. it is. I love it. And That's great. So, Very good. So, and if people want to contact you in particular, Jarrett uh, mentioned that maybe to reach out to you, what would be the best way for him or anyone else to contact you? Uh, um, email? I've been put out my email address, which is my name, Bruce Cryer at Gmail, Bruce Cryer at gmail.com. Uh, I have a site called BruceCryer.com, so that's pretty straightforward. And I'm on pretty much every major social media as my name. So you just look me up on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or LinkedIn. I'm my name, Bruce Cryer. That's it. With a Y, not an I. Bruce Cryer with a Y. Okay. And thank you all, by the way. Those of you who are here on, li on live, it's been lovely seeing your faces and seeing the comments and the smiles and the nods and all that. So thank you all for, for your presence today. Awesome. Thank you very much. And uh, just to kind of close off, just to let everyone know, that are listening here. To, again, thank you very much to Bruce, and thank you to all of you, and for your very insightful questions. And uh, we have some really exciting things coming up. I'll link them below, uh, different retreats and so forth. And um, so just if anyone's on here wants to hold on for a second, I'm going to just stop the recording. And if you have one last question or comment that you want to ask Bruce, uh, I'll just leave it open. So once again, thank you, and uh, we will see you next month. Bye for now.